We have been doing a series on Babylon and Zion. And today what we're going to talk about is accepting and embracing where you are at. When you think about your life, when you think about how you are right now, oftentimes what we do is we think about the best parts of where we're at right now. We won't highlight where we're weak. We won't highlight what we do poorly. When we think about ourselves, we tend to think about the best parts of who we are, right? If we're an adventurer, but we slack on fulfilling our word to everyone else, then we're like, I'm an adventurer. We don't highlight the fact that we usually don't keep our word, okay? If we are overeaters, uh, we talk about how we enjoy life, right? Not necessarily that we eat more than we should. Uh, Whatever it is, that's your vice. And we'll talk a little bit more about those a little bit later on. What we tend to do is downplay that and then highlight the positive part because we're all playing the game together. And we're trying to make ourselves look as good as we possibly can. Is that just me? Okay. I just want to make sure. Today what we're going to get into is recognizing where we're weak, recognizing the place that we are in in life right now, accepting that, and then believing that God will show us how to prosper through it. Does that make sense? You know, it's been about, uh, it's been about, 13, 14 months since I got fired from my job at State Farm. (laughs) So I was there for about seven years, actually to the day, exactly seven years. And while I was there, we traveled all around the world to different places all around the world. Our family did from things that we won, made lots and lots of money in that job. And the church started, if you look at Lucy, if you ever want to know how old the church is, look at Lucy. Because she was born right as the church began. Um, And the church began about midway through my career with State Farm. And in the beginning, there's some of you in here, uh, I promise we don't normally talk about money this much in this church. (laughs) Just ask someone that normally goes here. But in the beginning, um, uh, our family was the only one that was giving towards it. In fact, we weren't even a 501c3, so we were giving money towards the church and weren't able to write it off. Some of you have talked about how much you've given or sacrifices that you've given towards the church. It's easier to give towards something that looks legitimate. Can you guys, like, accept that? When you walk into a place and it's like, clearly the Lord is here. I don't mind dropping some money in the plate for a place like this, right? That's one thing. But if you walk in and it's like, I don't know, this is a living room. That's a little bit different. It's like, who are these people? What's going on behind the scenes, right? So back before it was cool to give, we were giving towards the church without any kind of tax break. Um And uh, I remember there being different times where I would think about the money that I was making versus anybody else in the church. Thinking about the sacrifice that our family was making and we weren't taking a penny from the church. And uh, as I look back and I see where things were progressing with my job, what I can see is that if God hadn't intervened, hadn't stepped in and done something that Who I am right now would probably be very different. The view that I might have of myself, if there's a problem here happening in the church, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I got it. You can thank me later when you all find out in heaven, right? But God would have none of that. Why? Because he doesn't share his glory. It is so hard for us to accept the fact, the fact That right now, God might be humbling us or bringing us to a place of brokenness to save us from who we would become. Think about it. Some of you in here, there's things that you're wanting to do 
and you just wish that God would give you what you need so you could do it, but he just won't. And you're just like, please, Lord, I'm waiting and suffering. And you don't realize that he's keeping you from becoming someone that you don't want to be. We ask him and beg him for the treasures and for all the gifts and the relationships and and all the, the great things. We ask him for these things, but we don't see that if he were to just pour out these things, we would lose our soul along the way. Over the past couple months, I've slowly begun to process things that happened eight months, a year ago with State Farm, everything that happened with Gabe. Right. For those of you who don't know, uh, Gabe was another pastor here and there was uh, sin that was exposed and uh, we had to remove him uh, from this church. Well, to most of you in this room, Gabe was someone that you liked. Maybe he was a a good friend, someone that you looked up to. Um, Others of you had deeper relationships with him. But for me, Gabe was my best friend my entire life, even from when we were little babies. And when I look back and see when we asked him to come up here and help with this little work that started in the living room and said, man, you got to come up here and see what God's doing. We need your help. What I realize now looking back is that I was absolutely 100 percent afraid. And I needed my friend to come up and help me because I knew that what was happening was bigger than me. And that I was not capable or competent. Now, the past is in the past. What's done is done. But I don't want to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Hear me on this. When I think about that decision, and if the Lord really wanted me to step forward with more confidence or to be more secure, to trust him more, and instead I bailed and said, Someone please come help. And if I did that and the Lord was wanting to teach me, I promise you this. I'm going to go around the mountain again to where he's saying, step up and be the leader that I'm calling you to be. Step up and be the leader that I'm calling you to be. And until I stop bailing from that process, it won't ever happen. Does any of this resonate? Any of the things that I'm saying? When you think about the things that God is bringing you through, I have met many people ranging in ages ranging in ages from 12 to 75 who are still going around the same mountains now the older that we get the more stuck in our ways we become meaning that we have come up with the absolute most airtight logically sound reasons for why we don't have to cross that bridge unfortunately it still remains the bridge that we're supposed to cross. Today, what we're going to talk about is embracing that bridge that you have not crossed, embracing the place that you find yourself in, embracing the things that you've rejected or resisted that have helped make your life what it is to this day. My hope is that I never get to the place where I stiff arm the truth because I'm afraid of what it might cost me to look at it. Meaning that if I know something is on my face, that I am not too scared of the mirror to go and look at it so that I can see the dirt and the mess that's on my own face. Does that make sense? I never want to get to the place where I know that I'm so unhealthy, therefore I don't want to go to the doctor because I don't want to hear the report that he's got. I don't want to go and look at my bank account. I don't want to go and add up those bills because I'm afraid of the disparity that exists. I don't even want to go and try and walk a mile because I'm afraid of how tired I'll get. I don't even want to go to the foot, the feet of Jesus because I'm afraid of what he might face me with. I don't want to look that person in the eye because of the offense that I hold against them. I don't want to talk about that conversation because of the pain that it still brings me. The other day when we were in uh, Portillo's is a few weeks ago, I thought I saw another State Farm agent that was there. 
Now, he just happened to be uh, one that was a little braggadocious. And uh, I knew him as someone who carried himself very successfully, right? And I thought I saw him out of the corner of my eye. And I thought, oh, no. Because what I've done on Facebook is I've unfollowed every single state farm agent. Because I don't want to see them going to places. I don't want to see them buying their new homes or their new cars or all these other things. I just don't want to think about that. And I realized that when I thought I saw him out of the corner of my eye, and my immediate response was to pretend like I wasn't there or like I didn't see him, I knew that that didn't line up with the way that I want to live my life. I don't want to live my life that way. I don't want to live my life where when I see someone across, I'm like, no, 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 right? <laughs> if, it, if you have people in your life that you do that with, you know what I'm talking about, right? No, oh, that didn't see, oh, hey, right? I don't want to live my life that way. And I'm pretty sure that you guys don't want to either. And so if we don't want to live our lives like that with people, why would we want to live our lives like that with things that are in our own hearts? Right. Wow. Because you can't walk away from that. You can't pretend like you don't see it. You know what you end up doing whenever you pretend like you can't see it? You have to like eat something or drink something or watch something or play something or play something. Or By the way, this morning, uh, uh, how many of you guys know what a trumpet sounds like? Okay. I know what a violin sounds like. Okay, and I could hear Emily's violin, but I promise you, as sure as I'm standing here, I'm not lying to you guys. Hopefully, you know, I shoot straight with you, but I promise you that I heard a trumpet playing this morning many times, and it was playing beautifully. Did anybody else hear a trumpet this morning? What? I'm not even, yes, Paul. Now, you know Paul wouldn't lie. There's other people you look in this room, and they're like, maybe they're embellishing, but Paul would not lie. Paul heard a trumpet too. Yeah. Well, that's crazy because I was just talking with Lindy this morning, and uh, I've been going through, you know, a real time of brokenness, dryness, feeling like uh, I'm empty in my heart. And she was asking me, you know, what do you want to see at church? And, and I said, I don't know, things I can't explain. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember as I heard that this morning, <laughs> I was looking around and I was thinking if that someone in the room was actually playing a trumpet. I was looking around and, and trying to hear that. And uh, what I would have rather, uh, what my flesh would have rather have done was to go through the motions and not have to address these things that are in my heart. But what I've learned is to push myself into that place where I'll receive the healing, even if I know it's going to be so devastating and so painful. And, and all the while when my flesh is saying, turn around and go the other way, my spirit's saying, I have to do it, I have to do it, I have to do it, and then I'm face to face with what's going to bring me healing. And even this morning, all along the way, last night, in preparing the message to talk about what we're talking about today, I'm being brought face to face with where I'm at in my life, with the things that are going on in my heart. And I'm sitting here and, and I'm thinking this morning, I got, I got nothing. I got nothing in me. I got nothing to give out of. This morning is the way that I felt. And as the songs are playing, you know, <laughs> I got to admit, I first walked up and I'm like, four instruments, Adam. I need to be brought out of my funk. <laughs> and it was beautiful. And there was like this other supernatural instrument that was just playing at the same time. And uh, I'm just weeping. And I'm weeping in like a very broken, non-inspiring to the masses kind of way. And uh, the Lord's working on my heart. Because I have to come face to face with where I'm at in my life right now. And when I look back, I have to see what kind of a friend have I been? What kind of a father have I been? What kind of a husband have I been? What kind of a mentor, or a pastor, a brother, son, uncle, cousin, nephew, grandson, 
have I been? What kind of an employer, employee? Do you guys know that I've gotten fired from like every job I've ever had? I'm not even kidding. I've gotten fired from like every job but one, maybe two, out of like 13. I never fit. Now I can say, once again, the adventurer versus not keeping, I can say, hey, I was just born to be a leader. <laughs> or maybe I lack some basic people skills <laughs> and certain disciplines that are needed to work at a place. Maybe so. But I have to be willing to face these things. Now, in total transparency, I'm trying to be broken first so that it's easier for us all to be broken. Does that make sense? I was on a trip recently with Elder Mark. We uh, flew to California, which was a four and a half hour flight. I thought you had to go international to get four and a half hours on a plane. <laughs> but we flew to Northern California to drive back in the most enormous vehicle that man is allowed to put on the road, <laughs> which is his RV. <laughs> it's like you're driving a semi with no training. And so we're sitting in there, and, uh, and I'm just like, I'm terrified the whole trip. I won't go into all the different details. Because it's raining, and the windshield wipers are broken, and Mark is just way too comfortable. <laughs> this whole thing, we're, we're going between mountains, and the whole thing is swaying back and forth like this. And the wheel is like this, you know, as he's driving. And, and we can't see anything, because it's raining, and it's snow, and you're like, you know, mountains everywhere. And I'm sitting over there just like gripping onto the seat. And he's leaning down to grab snacks <laughs> while he's steering like this. And I'm like, Mark, let me get you. What do you need, man? Let me get you what you need. But it was a great, it was a great trip that we took together. And uh, we got to uh, a place, both of us, I think anytime you make an investment like that, a time, money, you're trying to figure out, okay, Lord, what do you have planned? What is it that you want to do? Uh, number one, because that's true. Number two, because you don't want to waste anything. And um, when I was little, uh, when I was a kid, um, I uh, did a lot of terrible things. Um, if any of you have ever um, been molested or have molested somebody else when you were little or when you were younger, um, which, by the way, hopefully we've broken the ice enough in this place where it's like this is a place where we can be real and talk about things that need to be talked about. Um, both of those things happened with me when I was younger, when I was like 11, um, 6 to 11, different things like that. And... Um, the Lord provided an opportunity for me to meet uh, with someone that I did that to when I was a little kid that I haven't seen for 12 years. And um, as soon as I sat down, or as soon as I heard that there was the opportunity for this to happen, number one, I immediately grabbed it. Yes, that, let's do that. Let's make that happen because that needs to be made right. And uh, came and sat down, hadn't seen this person and. 12 years, 13 years. First thing I went to in the conversation before any niceties, before we said anything else, I said, I need to bring this out. She said, yes, that's something that, you know, I had thought about, but I had put it out of my mind, you know, and so, um, you know, you're obviously forgiven. But then some tears came, not just from her, but from her mom, who was also there. And what I realized is I looked back, and this was... This was a way that God had taught me to be. I've done a lot of damage in my life. I've done a lot of things wrong. I've broken a lot of things. And I've been broken a whole bunch. But what I recognize is these things don't just go away. At some point, I have to face them. And when I face them, God gives me the opportunity to reconcile them. Many of you know that from the scriptures, we have the ministry of reconciliation. What does this mean? This means making things right again, putting things where they belong, where they're supposed to be. I remember a story um, 
back when I worked at sales at a bank. <coughs> and uh, this is right when I started with sales. I had never done sales before. One of my first jobs was being a teller at a bank in downtown Houston. I was so excited because I got to wear a tie. I was like, <coughs> thinner back then. But I got to wear a tie, and I looked real nice, and it was in downtown Houston. I made like 16000 a year, which was a ton of money. <laughs> and uh, they immediately moved me to sales when they saw me talking with a few people. <coughs> well, I got to sales, and so now I'm sitting in sales, and I can sell people stuff, but when it comes time to deal with problems, right, like someone having to pay $400 in overdraft charges, right, and being face-to-face -face with that person. Well, that just so happens that opportunity presented itself to me. So the meanest customer, if any of you have ever worked at a place where it's like there's someone who's the meanest customer and they come in, anybody in here ever had that? It's like, this person's the meanest, watch out for them, <laughs> right? So one day on my list of people to call with overdraft charges is the meanest customer on our list in the entire bank, right, out of all our customers. And I had to call him up and say, he picked up the phone, hello? That's how the meanest customer talks. I said, you know, hello, Mr. So-and-so, this is Nick from IBC Bank. What do you want? Uh, just want to let you know you have about $400 in overdraft charges. I'll be right there. <laughs> so then I put down the phone and I immediately thought, I can't. And, and then I, I watched and he was coming. We had like a giant bank with windows and I saw him lurching towards the, the front. And he was coming in the, the bank and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I, I got under my desk. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I got under my desk, and I hid in there, and I heard his loud, booming voice in the lobby. And it's one big, open lobby, giant. And he's like, where's Nick? And I was like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and they were like, I saw him over there in his cubicle somewhere. Just go over there by him. I'm sure he's over there. And I was like, no, no, no. And so I hear him walking in, and I hear him walk into my little cubicle area, and I get my pen, <laughs> raise my pen, there it is, <laughs> oh hey, <laughs> and I remember the thoughts that were going through my head in that moment, it's like there's no way out of this, I can't go anywhere, <laughs> I'm eventually going to have to have this conversation with him, I can't do this, I don't know what I'm going to do, and, and this thought came into my brain that has stuck with me to this day, there's no way out of this situation, you are going to have to face it, you're going to have to face it. So I climbed out from under my desk, and I faced the situation, and he was so angry. But when it was done, it was done, and I felt freedom. And so what we're going to read about today is how the Israelites were in the same position. They were recognizing that they were brought to a place of confrontation, a place of discipline. And they could either pretend that it wasn't real or pretend that they were going to find another way out or that it wasn't going to be as bad as everyone was saying it was going to. Or they could recognize where they were at, embrace what the Lord was telling them, and pray that he would prosper them through it. Turn to Jeremiah 27. Verse 1. Would you quietly play that open door song from the whole tones on iTunes? In verse 1. Early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord said to me. Make a yoke out of straps and crossbars and put it on your neck. Then send word to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon through the envoys who have come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them a message from the masters and say, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Tell this to your masters. With my great power and my outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are on it. And I give, to anyone, give it to anyone I please. Does that sound like what the devil said to Jesus? These are my kingdoms. I can give them to anyone I please. 
Not so, says the Lord. Now I will hand all your countries over to my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I will make even the wild animals subject to him. All nations will serve him and his son and his grandson until the time for his land comes. Then many nations and great kings will subjugate him. If, however, any nation or kingdom will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, or bow its neck under his yoke, I will punish that nation with the sword, famine, and plague, declares the Lord, until I destroy it by his hand. So do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your interpreters of dreams, your mediums, or your sorcerers who tell you, you will not serve the king of Babylon. They prophesy lies to you that will only serve to remove you far from your lands. I will banish you, and you will perish. But if any nation will bow its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let that nation remain in its own land to till it and live there, declares the Lord. I gave the same message to Zedekiah, king of Judah. I said, bow your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people and you will live. Why will you and your people die by the sword, famine and plague? with which the Lord has threatened any nation that will not serve the king of Babylon. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who say to you, you will not serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying lies to you. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. They are prophesying lies in my name. Therefore, I will banish you and you will perish, both you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Then I said to the priests and all these people, this is what the Lord says. Do not listen to the prophets who say, very soon now the articles from the Lord's house will be brought back from Babylon. They are prophesying lies to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and you will live. Why should this city become a ruin? If they are prophets and have the word of the Lord, then let them plead with the Lord Almighty that the furnishings remain in the house of the Lord and in the palace of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem not be taken to Babylon. So let me give you a breakdown. What God is telling his people is you're hearing prophecies from prophets that are not sent by me. They're telling you that what I've already told you will happen won't happen. So let's go back to ourselves for a second, because anytime that you read the Old Testament, do your best to see yourself in that situation because it is for your benefit. OK, the word is a mirror for our souls. And so he's saying that you've surrounded yourself with people who will tell you what you want to hear. Think about this. When you've known that discipline needs to come or is already here, do you talk to people who will say things like you want to hear them, who will tell you what you want to hear? Do you surround yourself with people that agree with you, who will encourage you, in your offense, in your justification, or in your fleeing from the difficulty? Do you surround yourself with people who will simply affirm the things you know you're not supposed to do? This is what was happening to the people of Israel during this time. In the Bible, Egypt represents the world. If you look back at Israel, we've gone through over and over again, of how Egypt is a picture of the world. They're delivered from Egypt. They cross over the Red Sea. This is them being baptized, right? Egypt is referred to the land of slavery that they were in. They're delivered from that place. Egypt, when you see it in the Bible, often means the world. Well, Babylon, what we've talked about up until this point, seems to represent idolatry. It seems to represent the systems of this world. But I believe when you look back at the nation of Israel, and its captivity into Babylon, what you actually see is that they're being disciplined for not honoring the Sabbath. You remember that? Anybody remember how many years they were in captivity in Babylon? That's how many years they didn't honor the Sabbath. Seventy years. Guess what the average lifespan of a human being on planet Earth is? Seventy years. Seventy years they were in Babylon. And it just so happens to line up with our lifespan. When you look at them going into Babylon, what you see is that they're about to be disciplined for a lifetime. Let's go to Isaiah 31, verse 1. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here because I could either read the whole verse the way that it shows it, or you could see it in your Bible, and I could read it the way that I'm trying to infer 
um, meaning onto. So let me, let me read it. I'm going to replace the word Egypt with the world. Woe to those who go down to the world for help, who rely on horses. Horses are a symbol of power and strength, your own power, your strength. Who trust in the multitude of their chariots, same thing, and in the great strength of their horsemen. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Yet he too is wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He will rise up against the house of the wicked, against those who help evildoer. But the people of the world are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, he who helps will stumble and he who is helped will fall. Both will perish together. This is being given at the time of the exile. What was happening is that the people of Israel We're saying to themselves, we're hearing prophecies that we're going to be disciplined or sent into Babylon, but that can't be true because that sounds terrible. So they came up with a plan B. If that happens, we'll just call on Egypt. Egypt is super powerful, and they'll come to our rescue. They'll defeat Babylon for us. And so they reasoned with themselves that if the time ever came where it looked like they were going to fall prey or be taken into captivity to Babylon, they would simply go back to the world and rely on what they knew from the world to help them out of the discipline of God. Unfortunately, what God was telling them through these words was that if you try and rely on the world, you will fall and all of your help that you get from the world will also fall. He's saying your efforts will be futile. They'll be fruitless. They won't work. There's a story in Jeremiah 28. Go back and read it. Or you can let me do an illustration, which you guys know I love to do. Okay. So I looked for a yoke. We used to have a yoke, an actual yoke. But I couldn't find it. But I did find these long horns. (laughs) That kind of looked like a yoke. Kind of. You see, I do this. It's like a yoke. This is a bathroom. <laughs> but what the Lord told Jeremiah to do was to make a yoke and to walk around with this yoke on among all the people. Now, I want you guys to think we don't get this anymore. We don't get stuff like this. We are too, uh, what's the word, sophisticated for people to domesticate? <laughs> For people to, I mean, think about it. If a prophet walked around with a yoke in the middle of the streets of New York, how quickly would you ride him off? Would it be like two seconds? Five seconds? It wouldn't take long. It'd be like the underwear wearing cowboy that plays his guitar, right? A dude wearing a yoke and walking around the streets of New York. Most people wouldn't give him a single care or a thought, right? He would simply keep walking. But Jeremiah is walking around with a yoke on his back. And all the people are seeing him. All the people see it. And he goes into the king's palace. And there's this guy named Hananiah. Now I need you guys to play along with me here for a little bit. So when I picture Hananiah, I picture some dude with like a white bathroom on. Even though he definitely wasn't wearing a white bathroom. But I also picture him with like a British accent. Now, Hananiah is like this widely accepted uh, prophet. They had a lot of prophets for hire back then. Uh, Someone called them the king's prophets. I really like that. But what the kings would do is when the prophets wouldn't tell them what they wanted to hear, they started to get the picture over time, and they're like, we need to find somebody that will tell us what we want to hear. What they found is there was actually a lot of people who were willing to tell them what they wanted to hear if they would give them money. So if you're willing to give somebody money, there's a lot of people out there who will tell you what you want to hear. Now you might find them in churches. You might find them on TV shows. They might be writing books that you like, right? About how your life can be. About how you can get around the discipline of the Lord. About how he's not one way, he's only this way. You can find a lot of people if you're willing to pay them. So, Ananias speaks, and when he speaks, I want you guys to do me a favor. Everybody do this. This is a golf clap. So, look, whenever Ananias speaks, after he speaks, 
I want us all to walk that together. Because I think we'll all be able to get it just a little bit better. Right? So Hananiah comes in. Now I'm going to try and go back and forth real quick. Hopefully this doesn't look just super slow. But maybe it does, and that's how I want to look back into it. So look, Hananiah comes in, and he sees Jeremiah with this yoke. And what he says is, two years, in two years, everything will be brought back from Babylon, and all the nations that are under King Nebuchadnezzar's yoke will be broken. But he says like this, in two years, the yoke of the king of Babylon will be broken over all the nations that he subdued, and all the articles will be brought back. <laughs> so then Jeremiah is like this, he's like, uh, yeah, amen, I hope what you just said happens. I hope that actually happens. But know this, that the only way that your words will be accepted is if they actually come to pass. You don't get credit just for saying what people want to hear before it actually happens. Right? So then this is what Ananiah Ananiah, he looks at Jeremiah with the yoke on his back. And he comes to him and he says, he takes this yoke off. He takes the yoke off his back and he goes, and he breaks it and then he says this. <laughs> In the same way that that yoke was broken, so will the Lord break the yoke from the necks of the people that the king of Babylon has subdued. And then so Jeremiah walks away and he leaves at that moment. And he takes the yoke that he had. But then as he's leaving, the word of the Lord comes to him. And he says, the yoke of wood that you broke will be replaced with a yoke of iron. And you will die this very year. Two months later, God was dead. What's crazy is that most of the time, judgment never happens on prophets for hire like that. I want to tell you that the times that they were living in back then are not so different from the times that we live in today. You can find plenty of people who will tell you what you want to hear, especially if you're willing to pay them. And when you surround them with a great amphitheater and a giant expo hall, it makes their words sound that much more true. Can you hear what I'm saying? Let's go to Jeremiah 42. Look at verse 10. If you stay in this land, I will build you up and not tear you down. He's talk, God is talking to uh, the Israelites who were taken into captivity. Stay in this land, and I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you, for I am grieved over the disaster I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hands. I will show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your land. However, if you say, we will not stay in this land, or do not replace it with if you will not undergo this discipline that the Lord has for you. And so disobey the Lord your God. And if you say, no, we will go and live in the world. We will go and do what we knew to do from the days that we lived in the world, where we will not see war or hear the trouble or be hungry for bread. Then hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. If you are determined to go back to the world, and you do go to settle there, then the sword you fear will overtake you there, and the famine you dread will follow you back into the world, and there you will die. Indeed, all who are determined to go back to the world and settle there will die by the sword, famine, and plague. Not one of them will survive or escape the disaster I will bring on them. So what's happening in this moment? They've got nowhere to turn. God's telling them, if you go back to Egypt, I will find you. <laughs> What's happening here is God's giving them no way out of this discipline. I'm hoping that a little levity will help sink in the deep truth of the discipline of God. 
right? So the discipline of God cannot be avoided. You must undergo it. If you are sitting in here and you have misery, and you say to yourself, but I come to church, but I've been reading my Bible, but I've been praying, and I still feel like this. Therefore, I've given Jesus a chance, and it's still not working. Baloney. Baloney. Because he has discipline for us. And if we won't endure it and embrace it and ask him to bring us through it, then the very thing that we fear the most will come upon us even when we run back to our own strength. So he's saying to us today, don't run away from what I've put in your life to make you better. Look at Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you are, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Now, I've watched our society embrace this idea that people who are older don't have to necessarily accept the fact that they're older. If you are over 50, do you not realize that in the Bible, your role in society changes dramatically? Do you realize that in the Bible? What has happened is we've put so much value on people being at the prime of their life and in the best shape of their life and looking their absolute best that when you get to a certain age, you think, I now have less value. That's not true. It's just our society is doing it. Because the way that Christians are actually supposed to treat the elders is by listening to their wisdom, by honoring and respecting them. But because that hasn't happened, instead of us actually doing what the Word says and undergoing the discipline that it will take to get back to that pure place, we've simply all agreed to play the same game. That the people who are most valuable and who are most beautiful are the ones who should be shown the most respect. Unfortunately, our idea of beauty and respect and, and value is off. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. One of the quickest ways that we can see restoration in the church is if everybody embrace the season of life that they were in and lived it well. Whatever season that you're in, if you are young, then have your face in the dust and work your butt off. And don't reject it and think, it's, it's not fair. <laughs> There's no reason for you to act like that. Leviticus and Timothy give us clear instruction on what's supposed to happen with a young man in his youth. And you say, but it, it hurts. <laughs> it's supposed to hurt because it's literally breaking babiness off of you. It breaks you from being a baby. <laughs> and the whining that comes from when we work hard that's supposed to be broken. When you're in between the ages of, let's say, 20 and 50, <clears throat> recognizing where you're at. At this point in your life, you should be, you should have both some wisdom and still have some energy. And you should be leading. You should be stepping up and leading. You should be carrying out the duties and the calling on your life. By the time that you reach 30, you should now be taking over something. You should be running something, taking care of something. At the very least, your own household. And nowadays, unfortunately, because of where we're at, that's a lot. You can just run your household well. Just run your household well. A lot of men, they'll look and say, I know I may be a terrible husband, but I'm a good provider. You're called to both. They say, man, I, I may be a good father, but I'm a terrible husband. You're called to both. Well, I may have an issue with pornography or pleasing myself or flirting with women at work, but at least I bring home food. 
and I protect my family. Who's coming after your family every day with a knife and a gun that you think you're doing a good job of protecting your family? You think that it's only physical. Where's the physical threat that you face every day? I protect my family. How? Do you protect your family from the evil that wants to creep in to your home and get in front of your kids' eyes? Do you protect your family from the words that you speak to your wife when you're frustrated? If you've done it poorly, do not pretend that it does not exist or that it's not real. Embrace it and ask God to deliver you through it. It is a conversation that you need to come face to face with. Women, do you slander? Do you gossip? Do you let your emotions run away and live in fantasy lands? Do you escape your reality by doing something else? Have you invested all of your heart into something else besides your family and you just fulfill your role there task-wise but they don't have your heart and you found your identity somewhere outside? Do you resent your husband because he's out doing this and you're doing this? My goodness. Have you cooked potatoes? Do you put your husband down? Do you treat him with disrespect? Do you dishonor him? Do you slander him behind his back? Do you speak poorly of him in the streets and in the public square? It's not a public it's 31 line. Don't resist it. Don't be angry or offended. Embrace it and ask God to deliver you through it. I'm not your enemy, I promise. The word is not even your enemy. But there is an enemy, and he wants to steal everything and to kill your legacy and everything that you've invested in. And he wants to completely destroy the work of God. And even through you. Turn to John 9. We're almost done. Just a few more verses. You know, it's funny. We have a uh, I think seven people live with us right now. Then there's a couple of beautiful people right across the drive there. <laughs> What's crazy is when I'm going through these like really tough seasons, all I want to do is just isolate myself and sit and feel sorry for myself. But there's always someone that's like, hey, you got a second? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got a second? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> John 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. So Jesus just went and did like a miracle that proves he's the Messiah. Right? Was upset. Uh, Jesus heard that they had thrown the blind man after he just healed him. He found him. He said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. He worships me. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world. Discipline is a part of judgment. So that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Did you catch that? So that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Did you see Jesus striking people with blindness? Then what did he mean? Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? <laughs> Jesus said, If you were blind... You would not be guilty of sin, but now, you, now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. What did he say to him? He's like, if you just admitted that there is a problem, I would come to you and I would perform a miracle that showed you that I'm the Messiah. But because you claim that you're fine, then you're stuck in your sickness and your blindness. When we can't admit that we are blind, if I cannot admit that right now, this day, today, that I am blind, and I cannot be healed of my blindness. He said, but I'm saved. You were saved from Egypt. You were saved from the world. Yes, praise God. Praise God that you were saved from who you used to be, and you were destined for destruction. And praise God that you will be saved 
on the day that he returns. You'll be saved from this temporary world and this temporary body that you live in. But today is the day of salvation. And so today we need healing from our blindness. Today we need healing from our sickness. So come face to face with me, even now in this moment. Come face to face with me. Because almost as soon as I began talking, for a lot of you, it came up. And you knew what I was talking about. And it's different all around here. Why? Some of you still are coming in. You think you're the only one? You think you're the only one that looks back? I genuinely have regrets about decisions that I've made. Because I know that not only was it a poor decision, it was actually a sin. Because I knew the good that I was supposed to do and I didn't do it. Now, has God worked all things together for my good according to his purposes? Of course, that's what his scripture says. <coughs> but I can look back and I can see these things were done and it brought pain and hurt to people. And it hurt the heart of God. And it caused Jesus to have to be crucified on the cross. So yes, contrary to popular opinion, you can have regrets and it can still be a healthy thing because I can look back and I can say, I don't want to do that again. That was something that I did and it brought pain. And it stunted my growth and possibly the growth of other people. But praise God that Jesus has delivered me from that because I've admitted it, I've accepted it, and he's delivered me through it. But to this day, why would you turn around and doubt the saving power of Jesus for the issues that still need to be saved today? If he's healed you of your lame legs, why would you doubt that he can fix your broken arm? If he's giving you sight to your blind eyes, why wouldn't you go to him for your deaf ears? If he's put a word on your tongue when your heart was stoned, why would you rob him of the chance to lift your burdens today? 1 John 1. Verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim we have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Listen to this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we'll just confess, if we'll just bring these things to light, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us purely from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word has no place in our lives. Boom, tough words. If we claim we have not sinned, even to this day, not in the past, I was always a good person. No. If you claim that you are without sin, Jesus says it to the Pharisees with the adulterers. If you claim that you're without sin, even now, even now, then you're stuck. You're stuck. But if we will simply expose ourselves, despite what it may do to man's opinion of us, if we'll expose ourselves and the darkness that's within, He'll heal us. He'll heal us. Hebrews 12. We start in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. 
Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You want to know something crazy? We often look at Abraham with Isaac, and we see it in a vacuum. We see Abraham going to offer Isaac, and we think, yes, he was going to offer Isaac. God was using this as a demonstration to show Jesus. Yeah, but it was also discipline. Think about this. Abraham had relations with his wife's servant to produce a son, according to the promise that God had given him. Thereby showing that he wanted the promise more than to trust the promise given. This is a sin for Abraham to do. And so when the time comes and his son is fully grown, most people say that his son was about the age of Jesus when he walked up the mountain, the same mountain that Jesus would be crucified. We miss the fact that Abraham in that moment is undergoing the discipline of God. His heart is being ripped into as he's taking his son up there undoubtedly. But he believes that God is able to raise Isaac from the dead if necessary because he has now embraced the idea that God is the true fulfiller of the promise, not him. And so he's willing to give God this son in an effort to learn the lesson that he bypassed 30-something years before. So now 30-something years later, he's having to show God, yes, I will trust you to give me my son. And God teaches him that lesson. And then gives him more blessings and more promises as a result of his obedience. In John 12. Verse 23. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Save me from the discipline I'm about to undergo. Because you know, God, it's not even me that actually deserves this discipline. It's all these people that have sinned. That wasn't his attitude. His attitude instead was, no, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. What if our attitudes in the midst of discipline was the same as that of Christ Jesus? I'm about to undergo something that will literally kill me. And my answer is, Father, glorify your name. If this will make me mature and complete and more like you, then let me undergo the discipline and I'll count it as pure joy. Because it will bring about your kingdom in my life. And therefore, in the lives of others, because his kingdom can't help but expand. So will you undergo that discipline? Will you undergo the discipline of God? Will you allow him to take you through that gauntlet? Maybe for some of you in here, you're thinking, there's too many confessions. If I were to begin to start back over in that way, it would be too much. I'd end up in jail. Better to be in jail in this life than held captive for two. First Thessalonians 5, this is the last one. Verses 1 through 3. Now, brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. I talked more about the end times this past week than I have in years. It's been coming up more and more. We've sat down with people one on one, talking in a group setting about the way that the Lord will return. I want to tell you this the same scenario that Jeremiah was living in while the people of Israel were taken into captivity, the 
is the same way that it will be before the Lord's return. People will be saying, peace and safety, it's all good, we've got plenty of time, it's all good, right up until the last day. People will be eating, drinking, being married, marrying each other, being given in marriage, laughing it up, great time, and then boom, the day of the Lord is upon Prophets will come. What's crazy is if you look at Babylon, that chronological time chart, some of you have seen one like those forever, you stretch it out and you look, and the prophets were speaking. So many prophets were speaking right before Babylon. And then so many prophets were speaking during Babylon, and so many prophets were speaking right after. It's like this concentration of prophets right around Babylon. They were there. Were you listening? The prophets are speaking. Are you listening? The return of the Lord is near. Peter said, we're in the last days. That was 2,000 years ago. I want to tell you this. The church is supposed to shine. But if you've been waiting to undergo the discipline of the Lord until his wrath is poured out on this earth, you will find yourself unprepared. Why does it say the love of most will grow cold between heaven and 24 and in the last days? Why? Could it be because people have developed a sense of intolerance towards the Lord's discipline? And now when things are actually getting hard, actually getting hard, they want no part of it. Train yourself now to accept and embrace the Lord's discipline so that as the days get more and more evil, you will be ready to endure and stand firm 